Right now, nestled inside of the 2,200 square feet or 211 meters of any average American home, there are about 100 different species of flies, spiders, beetles, ants, and other insects living in there. Humans, of course, are another species, and there are likely between two or three of them in there as well. In total, about 3,000 species of animals are currently found in homes across the world. A good majority of these are called domestic species. But I'm not talking about pets here, like cats, which for some reason just kind of domesticated themselves a few thousand years ago. Of course, cats have places in our homes. But like pets, these domestic species have adapted to live specifically in domestic environments or spaces inside of our homes or around humans. And they don't live anywhere else but closely inside of our orbit. I'm talking about animals like carpet beetles and bed bugs even, which don't really occur in the wild. They live their entire lives inside of our buildings. When we think of ecosystems, we think of forests or oceans or savannas maybe. Rarely do we consider the microcosm of life that exists inside or between the walls of our houses that we build. Yet an average house is an ecosystem. The system is regulated by certain characteristics of the home environment and the animals that participate in it, including us. Many of those non-human species have come to depend on our presence. How does this ecosystem work and what is our relationship to it? Is it a case of since we built it, we can do whatever we want? Or do we have some other responsibility here, both ethically or just practically? The ecosystems of our home are delicate and complex networks of exchanges between its design and the activities inside. Of course, different parts of the building attract different kinds of life. Outside, eaves are important nesting sites for birds like swallows or wasps. Inside of the walls, too, can be a place where mice, wasps, or honeybees live. Inside in the basement, you might have cellar beetles where it's dark and then they can find food. In the kitchen, larder beetles that feed on animal products or flower beetles will eat, well, flour. In the attic, you'll find things like spiders, ladybugs, and of course, bats. Some architects like Joy Swang create structures or modifications to buildings that are specifically designed for these species to thrive alongside of us. Rather than thinking about animals as, you know, external to our world, it's like we have to start thinking about them as community members and neighbors. They live right next door to us. They live in our buildings. Um, they're part of our world. So my name is Joyce Huang. I am an architect. I'm an associate professor at University of Buffalo. I run a practice called Ants of the Prairie, which is a small practice that works on designing structures that incorporate ecological conditions, specifically looking at incorporating uh, conditions for, for wildlife. Synanthropic species are basically animals that, that have been integrated into, into human-built conditions. So um, animals like raccoons and rats. Other examples might be like sparrows, pigeons. They are all predisposed to living around humans. Some of the insects from before, like the carpet beetles, are called commensal, which translates as guests that eat at the same table. They live in our homes, but don't really do any harm. They don't cause disease or damage. Inquilines, on the other hand, live in the nest and feed directly off of our waste without really doing any damage. Silverfish and book lights are good examples of this. Those are in contrast to parasites, but I don't want to get into that. So, inside of our homes have unique ecosystems that aren't found anywhere else in nature. These developed over thousands of years as agriculture allowed societies to just slow down and maybe set up permanent residences that we would return to regularly. You know, not nomadically moving with herds of buffalo or something. This stability is coupled with four main features of the space inside a house that are unique. First, houses are dry. The animals that take up residence here tend to like low humidity and protection from the rain, just like we do. But interestingly, a number of animals that we find in our houses actually developed in almost desert-like climates, like pharaoh ants or the woodlouse that's able to get the water that it needs directly out of the air. They adapted this from their native desert climates where they couldn't rely on rain. In addition to dryness, these animals are also seeking the comfort of warmth, food, and protection from prey. All of these, of course, are why we like buildings too. But our structures are used way more by non-human animals than they are by us humans. And we don't really think of it that way, though. And I'm guessing that doesn't really fit the picture in your minds of how the built environment is supposed to work. I think to make, to make a space truly welcoming and comfortable for animals, you have to really choreograph your life with the animal's life. If there are places where you're doing things like eating, places that need to be clean, 
you would need to find a way to design your home so that the animals live somewhere else. Buildings are supposed to clearly delimit the inside from the outside, the good nature from the bad nature. In this case, good nature means clean potable water, not leaks or rainwater. And in this case of animals, we may choose to have a few pets of acceptable domestic species, but beyond that, the rest should just stay outside. Homes are a sort of sacred space where we expect a certain level of control over it. Part of this control is about dictating who can and can't enter. If someone or something enters, it should be by invitation only. When architects think of designing buildings, you're usually thinking about designing for people and not for animals. She go to great lengths to ensure this barrier between the two realms remains as impenetrable as possible. Filters, seals, screens, airtight details are all important soldiers in the battle to main this fundamentally imbalanced equilibrium. This attention also targets the outside of buildings to make sure that animals don't get too comfortable on or near them. Building cracks or seams or other potential nesting locations where say like a, a swallow might take up residence are quickly patched and sealed. And if we let our attention drift too long, any building can fall victim to an infestation. And some animals like termites actively make our buildings unsafe by eating away at the wooden structure. Interestingly though, maintaining this separation effectively isn't just about how much money that you throw at the problem. You might say that like a, a poorer household that's maybe cleaned less regularly or its maintenance isn't quite as up to date would have more animal species inside of it than say like a, a wealthier household. But it's actually the opposite. Wealthier homes usually have more species due to their proximity to gardens and other wildlife. Either way, there is a huge rift between this perceived role of the buildings that we inhabit versus the reality of their situation. The reality is that our buildings are complex ecosystems that not only serve humans, but hundreds, if not thousands of interrelated species whose delicate balance is important in ways that we can't predict or even really comprehend. And this is an area where thinking of humans as lone exceptions in a world that serves only our needs can get us into real trouble. You can't foresee what's gonna be useful or not useful, right? Um, at some point, someone thought bats were pests and then realize only after they start dying that they actually eat mosquitoes. The animals that we tend to like, these are called charismatic species. Dogs, cats, or even polar bears are considered charismatic species. We invite them into our home. Well, maybe not the polar bears, but this idea of charisma plays a big part in what we find acceptable or what creeps us out. I almost feel like any animal, um, if you put it on Instagram, it's going to become a star at some point. I've seen a lot of attention on baby bats on Instagram. For example, there's a there's uh, a baby bat called Lil Drac, and it's very cute. But just like any ecosystem, the ecology inside your home is pretty nuanced and delicate. Take, for instance, a massive project in China that was meant to solve its hygiene problem by targeting certain species for removal. This happened in the late 1950s and 60s, and it was called the Four Pest Campaign. On the surface, it had good intentions. Get rid of the animals that seemed to cause problems and diseases. They decided that the best four species to target were rodents for their role in spreading the plague, mosquitoes for spreading malaria, flies, and sparrows who were eating a lot of the country's rice and fruits before they could be harvested for food. Sparrows weren't really part of the hygiene problem, but ate rice at an astounding rate, four pounds or two kilograms of grain per sparrow per year. That's not an insignificant amount which affected crop yields. So the country banded together and encouraged all citizens to do their part to eradicate every sparrow. They were hunted and people would just make lots of noise with pots and pans and drums to scare them until they died from exhaustion. Sparrow nests were destroyed, their eggs were broken, and then the chicks were killed. The campaign was so intense that sparrows were nearly driven to extinction in China. This had some unforeseen, dire consequences. While sparrows did eat rice, they also ate a lot of insects. The imbalance caused by removing them from the ecosystem seemed to favor locusts, whose population skyrocketed to unprecedented levels. The locusts devastated crops, which significantly contributed to the Great Chinese Famine when 45 million people starved to death. If we want to intervene inside of this ecosystem, we should do so carefully. Part of this means considering animals as cohabitants in the ecosystem, which is a more accurate and probably healthy way to think about our relationships. Animals inhabit the world and share the world with us in every way possible. So if you're not thinking about them while you're designing, you're gonna have to deal with them later on. This rebranding hints that maybe we have a little less control over the system than we might like. 
But if we think of ourselves as good neighbors, it can have a cascade of benefits. Some general things that you might consider doing are to maintain corridors across your yard that allow wildlife to move more freely. You can also reduce the amount of light pollution that your household generates. Bright lights can really disrupt the natural behaviors of nocturnal animals. Or you might think about installing a green roof or a green wall, which can provide habitats for plants and insects while helping to insulate your home. If we understand the roof or the wall of a house as a space that can be inhabited by other species, then we can start thinking about those kinds of enclosures as a more expanded environment. So not just a kind of thin membrane that keeps the inside away from the outside, um, but something that's more expanded, that's more, that's more um, gradiated. So let's do a thought experiment around that average American home. And let's imagine that you do something simple, like building a bat house. It would be a safe place for bats to be able to find homes and maybe raise their young. This would help offset the destruction of their typical habitats. Beyond just helping to maintain a healthy and diverse ecosystem, bats offer a natural control mechanism for other species which you might find even more undesirable, like moths and mosquitoes. And they're important pollinators that aid in the regeneration of forests and other habitats. In the work that I've been doing, designing installations and built projects to support bat habitat, I've been really interested in creating projects that are conspicuous, projects that are visible and announce the presence of bats. I think it's important to give identity to, to the animals to really kind of celebrate their presence. Joyce took me to a house for bats that she designed to keep the animals nearby and visible. The project is called To Middle Species with Love. And it's basically, uh, if you can kind of look up this mm -hmm. right here, the top of this is basically a bat house. So it's, it's modeled after a rocket box, which is a, a kind of typical type of bat house that's been proven uh, to be effective for the endangered Indiana bat. It's located about um, you know, 12 to 16 feet above above ground, which is a kind of decent height for, for bats. And then this part down here is um, a pile of local stone. Yeah, when we were building this structure, one of the things that happened is as we were stacking the stones, like little toads actually started to like hop <laughs> into it. Inside the complex ecosystems of our built environment, it's clear that the lines between nature and nurture, between the wild and the domesticated, are more blurry than we think. Our homes are sacred spaces, but also thriving ecosystems. And this narrative that our buildings are solely for human comfort is severely limited, to a point that it's almost detrimental to how we even adapt the world to our needs. The reality is that our homes are shared spaces, teeming with life, and each species playing a role in the delicate balance of this microcosm. Most of us won't be killing all the sparrows in China or even erecting public bat sculptures, but these examples, I think, underscores the importance of understanding and even respecting the intricate network of life that exists inside of our walls. So maybe we can challenge the traditional notions of what it means to inhabit a space with intruders or pests. Let's cohabitate with those species, maybe not just the charismatic ones. Let's recognize maybe a wider range of animals that contribute to the health and vitality of our shared environment. Maybe you will personally feel a little bit more fulfilled in your new position in the natural order, but more importantly, it will go a long way to making better decisions about the way that we build. Joy showed me all around Columbus, Indiana to check out human-built animal habitats. She brought out her bat detector, and we hunted through a barn that was filled with gorgeous furniture looking for even more evidence of bats. It was a blast. We spent an entire day together, even though only a few seconds of it made it into this video. I just couldn't leave it there, so I made a full video of Joyce teaching me all about animal architecture, and it's on Nebula, the streaming platform that's owned by us creators and who's also helping support me by sponsoring this video. Sam at Wendover Productions, Real Engineering, Not Just Bike, City Beautiful, and many more of the folks that you watch are also part of the hand-selected crew of educational creators that's on Nebula. And it is by far the best place for viewing our videos and to support me in making content like this. The viewing experience is silky smooth and you'll never be shown an ad. Subscribers to Nebula get early access to our videos. For instance, it's where you can watch jet lag before it drops anywhere else. All right, here we go. A lot of us also make companion videos like the one that I made with Joyce, which aren't on YouTube because it doesn't really follow their algorithm. And there's also Nebula originals, like Real Life Lore's Modern Conflicts. Who knows, maybe I'll have an original on there soon. And there's also Nebula Classes, where creators share behind the scenes insights into their process, giving you an opportunity to learn how the Friday Checkout makes a video, or how Foreign tells stories, or how Patrick Willems makes movies. You can gain full access to this world of amazing videos simply by clicking on the link on the screen or in the description. 
It's only $2.50 per month when you sign up for a year. Not only will you unlock the entire catalog of treasures of your favorite YouTubers, but you'll also be supporting me in producing content that explores the environment that we inhabit.